Hello, everyone. Happy Recovery Day. Today on The Final Bar, we'll talk to Carolyn Board and technical analyst, expert in Fibonacci analysis. We'll talk about her take on this market environment, where the S&P is at. We talk about sort of a range within a range. The S&P pushing to the upside, closing just about 45.85. That's up almost one and a half percent. But the NASDAQ really pushing things higher with communication services, number one, technology, number three, real estate, fairly defensive sector right in the middle. Ladies and gentlemen, this is The Final Bar. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the Chief Market Strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we focus on the market environment and focus on the message the markets provide back to us, analyzing trends, momentum, price action to better understand investor behavior, better anticipate what's coming next, and focus on how those trends are evolving. The short-term movements of today connected to the long-term trends overall. I was doing a webcast uh, earlier today for the Money Show with uh, Greg Schnell, and uh, we were talking about cannabis stocks. We were talking about the, uh, you know, basically the long-term downtrend that we've seen in the cannabis space. Some of those tickers like MJ and YOLO and others, uh, but also some of the individual names like Tilray and Canopy Growth and uh, and others. And the, and the challenge is they're coming, they're, they're bouncing very nicely this week, but off of fairly depressed levels. And when you look at the market as a whole, it's interesting that you have uh, sectors like energy just ripping to the upside. Financials, a lot of new swing highs uh, earlier today and I, as I was uh, scanning for new three-month highs. But you also have groups like cannabis and others that have been in pretty established downtrends. And what happens is the market is netting out to this sort of sideways choppy action. The question, do bulls take enough control to push us out of this range I'm very excited to talk to today's guest, Carolyn Borden, joining the uh, Broden, excuse me, joining the show for the first time and uh, and getting her take on uh, on that very question. Tomorrow's guest, by the way, on February 10th, we have Ryan Dietrich from LPL Research. Next week on Tuesday the 15th, Jay Soloff from Investors Alley, and then on Wednesday the 16th, Sean McLaughlin, the Chief Options Strategist at All Star Charts. Let's continue on with our market recap today, brought to you by our friends at Chaken Analytics. You can go to Stock Charts ACP in the bottom right corner. There's a little plug icon. Click on that to find out all about the uh, plugins on ACP, including a fantastic one with the Chaken Power Gauge from uh, Chaken Analytics. We look at this market environment today. We'll look at a chart of the S&P here in a few moments, but overall, the uh, S&P is certainly you know, following through to the upside today. Yesterday, going into the close, kind of had this nice rally. And the question is, is that sustainable? Do you see further upside potential? Uh, we started to see that uh, certainly today with the S&P finishing up almost one and a half percent, closing above 45.50 all the way almost to uh, to 4,900. Uh, the NASDAQ, the NASDAQ uh, 100, uh, both up over 2%. Uh, and the VIX is uh, right at 20, actually, coming off uh, during the course of the uh, of the day today. Mid caps and small caps up as well and sort of mixed right around the returns of the, uh, of the S&P 500. Interest rates came off today. Yesterday, you hit 197 on the 10-year, which was a new peak here for the swing. We came off a little bit, uh, ending the day around 193, but again, still fairly elevated uh, relative to the last uh, you know, 6, 12 plus months. We're sort of at the upper end of where we've been. We're making uh, new swing highs. And the question is, do we continue to maintain that uh, that upswing in rates? My assumption would be yes, given what we're hearing from the Fed and uh, and I would think about that uh, potential environment, what that means for uh, different sectors. Now, today, for example, though, you have rates coming off and you have uh, um, you know, things like communication services, technology, both having really decent days. If you look at the commodity space, uh, a lot of green when I'm looking at this uh, at this list of, uh, of tickers. Oil prices using the USO up 0.8 percent. Gold prices up a third of a percent. Uh, when I was looking for uh, for new swing highs, no gold miners in there, but certainly other miners like BHP and Rio Tinto and others. Uh, came off of the screen of uh, of new uh, three-month highs. 
Finally, cryptocurrencies, a lot of upward movement there. You see Ether prices breaking above uh, 3,100 uh, earlier after selling off in, uh, you know, earlier in the day, rotating back to the upside, currently just above 3,250. Bitcoin getting near and nearer to uh, 45,000. And this is coming off of you know, fairly low levels not too long ago. We're sort of in the mid-low 30s. So a nice move uh, to the upside. We'll look at a chart of Bitcoin a little bit later. We'll talk about uh, what that, uh, how that trend has potentially really started to uh, reverse. You know, the chart of the S&P 500, I'm looking at the daily chart. We talk about sort of this range within a range. And, uh, you know, it's interesting is if you look at this pink shaded area, that's right about where we were for much of the day today. And that's right about where we were September of last year. So for the past five months, even though we've chopped around quite a bit, this has been sort of a sideways uh, range bound market. So, you know, if you look at it that way, the uptrend really was going through August and September, then things really started to change. Now, a lot of individual stocks have had uh, moves and have gone to new highs. A lot of individual stocks have certainly broken down, but the markets themselves and how those individual names aggregate into a, uh, into a broad market index, pretty much sideways. I were right about at that same level that we were in September. Now we have a much broader range with 42 to 4,300 on the lower end. That's the lows over the last uh, four or five months. On the upper end, we have 4,700 to 4,800. We've tested those levels a number of times here uh, as we've, uh, as we've uh, you know, uh, moved higher at times. Right now, we're sort of in the middle of that, uh, of that range. Now within that larger range, I would argue we have a smaller range here. We have the 61.8% retracement level around 4,590. If we just take the high and the low from January, we also bounced off the 38.2% level. And what's interesting here is those line up pretty well with the 50-day moving average around 46.10, the 200-day moving range, uh, average around 44.50. I would uh, suggest or I would anticipate that whichever way we break, at some point, we have to break out of this range within a range. We get above 46.10, we get below 44.50. I wouldn't be surprised if the direction of that break tells you the next big move that we're going to see in uh, stocks. We get much higher than this. We get above the 50-day. I think the chances of us retesting those previous highs is absolutely very real. Uh, and that's where I would be looking. However, we are one or two bad days away from this chart completely changing uh, character. So in this sort of environment, a choppy environment, you look to see which side takes control, I would argue. And at this point, I think it's still uh, it's still left to be seen. But a nice update that's putting us right up to the highs uh, that we uh, that we met last week. On a sector basis, you'll see communication services uh, number one uh, with the XLC up 2.8%, REITs number two up 2.4%, technology materials uh, basically tied for number three, just over 2%. On the downside, you have some defensive sectors like staples, which were essentially flat, utilities only up a half a percent, and kind of an interesting one, financials. Now, rates came off, so it's not surprising financials did not do as well as some of the other uh, some of the other sectors. But overall, some of, when I'm screening for stocks making new swing highs, I'm finding uh, quite a few in uh, in some of those uh, some of those areas. Talking about just a couple a uh, couple other charts here to finish off our uh, our market recap. As I was looking for stocks making new swing highs and new swing lows, I was looking at the materials sector. I saw some of the names that were starting to improve, particularly the miners. And I was looking at uh, BHP, uh, this sort of a rounded bottom, if you will, sort of this rotation from distribution to accumulation. I love that really consistent support level around fifty two fifty made a new swing high in early December and now breaking out above the 200 day, testing that from above and then rotating higher. So sort of a really good kind of natural stop built in, right? The swing lows from January right at the 200 day moving average. You remain above that. This is still a chart that's in a nice row, uh, rotation higher. Um, same group, you have Rio Tinto, almost an identical chart, this rotation uh, higher in December, kind of bouncing uh, bouncing off of there. So I was looking at some of the other names in uh, materials and just starting trying to make sense of some of these names. And, and FCX sort of drew my attention, you know, starting to form or, or really completing what could be arguably a, uh, a, a cup and handle pattern, which is basically when you have a big run higher, you hit an extreme level here when, uh, when, when the stock hit resistance, about 46. This sort of rounded bottoming pattern, it's about a six, seven month pattern. You can see we've rotated back up to those previous highs around uh, 46, and now pulled back once again, and now we're coming back up to that previous uh, high. So at the very least, this is a basing pattern, meaning a rally and a consolidation phase. Maybe it's a it's a cup and handle like pattern, but breaking above 46 in either case is the all clear signal. That would be the indication that uh, the charts are in the uh, in the clear and that there's much more upside potential uh, given the length of time, the height of that base and it resolving to the upside, but it has to resolve it first. And that's what's interesting about this market. You have setups like this that have not quite followed through just yet. 
I would I would imagine if the S and P is breaking out of its range, charts like this most likely sort of participate and break to the upside. And so it's not just the S and P that gives you the signal; it's a lot of individual stocks uh, that start to show signs of uh, of improvement, start to show signs that uh, that things are rotating to the upside. Today's guest is uh, coming to us from Las Vegas, so I have to go to LVS. I, I, I'm, I'm sure, right? As I'm talking about names that are starting to make new swing highs, Las Vegas Sands and some of these other gambling stocks are starting to rotate to the upside. Now, in general, when we've talked about this chart before, and it was this sort of environment, reminds me of some of the cannabis stocks I was looking at with uh, Greg Schnell earlier today. This is not my normal sort of setup. I don't really look for new lows opportunistically. I'm, I'm looking for things to, you know, those are the types of charts I would avoid. What I want to see is some sign of, of a rotation, some sign of accumulation, some sign that the selling pressure has abated, buying power is coming in, that there is a change of character in the chart. Arguably, you're starting to get that on a chart like uh, LVS. It's now making a new six-month high. It's gotten above these previous swing highs. If you look at what happened here, we traded up to 42. It went back down, made a new low to 34, which is actually back to the March 2020 low. Now getting above it in 42, which served as resistance, now becomes support. And there's sort of your natural stop, sort of the upper end of that gap as a potential way to manage downside risk. But this is a stock that's now back above its 200-day moving average for the first time since June of last year. Other things that came up on my new high screen, things like uh, some hotels, uh, things like cruise lines, like CCL and others, who certainly starting to see a rotation on uh, on some of these uh, some of these nays. The question, of course, is can you sustain those gains? And that's where I would be focusing on some of those levels of support, uh, levels of risk management on these charts. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back with today's guest, Carolyn Baroden. We'll see you in a minute. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Bar. This is Dave Keller here at StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for joining us every weekday after the close as we look at these markets using the toolkit of technical analysis, quantifying price, trend, momentum, and really investor behavior to try to understand the trends underlying these, uh, these assets. A couple quick announcements before we get to today's guest, Carolyn Barodin. First off, we welcome your questions. We did a mailbag segment on yesterday's show. We'll do another one at the end of the week on Friday's show. And your questions are, are uh, very, very welcome. Anything about technical analysis, about stock charts as a platform, particular indicators or charts that you're struggling with, just let us know how we can help. Our email is thefinalbar at stockcharts.com. We're on Twitter at FinalBarSCTV. We're on YouTube. Put a comment below the video you're watching on our YouTube Stock Charts channel. We'll gather all your questions and hope to answer one of yours in our next mailbag segment on Friday's show. Also, go to StockChartsTV.com. That is our on-demand platform. It is completely free. All of our great interviews like uh, Carolyn Baroden and others, special events like The Pitch, our market outlook specials from January with Larry Williams, Martin Pring, Tony Dwyer, many more, all on demand from our website or on your mobile device. Just search on any of the app stores for Stock Charts TV on demand. I want to welcome on today's guest, Carolyn Baroden. Carolyn is joining us for the first time. She's a technical analyst with Fibonacci Time and Price. Carolyn, it is a pleasure to meet you virtually, and thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. So as we're thinking about this market environment, I want to bring up your uh, your charts right here. We're going to start with a weekly chart of the S&P 500. Talk us through what you're seeing here. It's obviously been a nice, uh, at the very least, a nice bounce off of recent lows. How are you seeing this market? Right. Well, you know, once the market started correcting and we were seeing a deeper correction than we usually do, I wanted to go back to this higher time frame chart to see if any of the prior declines were similar to the current decline. And I ended up finding it. If you look over on the left hand side of the chart where that prior decline was 594.33, I basically projected 100 percent of that from the high that was made in January. And that's what gave us the support or part of the support that comes in at the 4219 to 24 area. So uh, you can see that um, these, these were not exactly the same, but they were very similar because 594.33 and 596, which was the you know second pullback, is very similar, okay? And there were also, I believe, at least one other retracement that overlapped that area. 
Now, the way I have to look at it is, well, you know, if it held the support, you knew that we needed to look for buy signals. But right now, if we can clear that 618 retracement, it really increases the odds for a continued rally towards my typical upside target, which would be the 1272 extension at the 4980 area. Got it. So we're almost there. We got very, very close there at the uh, at the yes. close today. So a key level to watch there, 4590. Um, I appreciate that. Your second chart, Carolyn, is looking at uh, Amazon. Talk us through this one. Okay. So as far as Amazon's concerned, um, you know, the larger picture, you definitely have a pattern of lower lows and lower highs. And what I ended up doing was running all projections of some of these prior swings over on the left-hand side of the chart. You can't actually see them all at this point, but they are there. And then I also ran retracements and extensions of prior swings. And I found two areas that stand out to watch for a possible failure and sell entry. You know, maybe somebody wants to buy some put options if we get into these zones. Mm -hmm. And then if that's followed with a sell trigger. Now, besides the actual uh, zones there, I also have timing cycles. Now, you can see the um, you know, horizontal lines um, where I have some dates between the 7th through the 9th. And since we are trading straight up into the 7th, 9th, we want to anticipate a possible pullback or reversal at that time. So we're close. We're not quite there. But those are the areas that I want to watch for a possible fail. Oh, this is fascinating. You're combining price and time in a, in a pretty yep. meaningful way. And I love that approach to some established levels of resistance some projected levels of resist, resistance and how that lines up with uh, with some of the, uh, the the timing coming coming due as well. Yeah. Your, your next set of charts here, Carolyn, is talking about Bitcoin. Now, it's obviously been a lot of focus on uh, on cryptocurrencies in general. Cryptos have been you know fairly weak in recent months, but really starting to bounce off of the lows. How are you seeing this? Okay, so, you know, when it started breaking down again, I had to go to the bigger picture and see what I saw there. So I backed it up to the weekly chart and I found that we had a major declining swing that was very similar to the one that we just had. So the prior swing was uh, 36096 in length. And then the second one is 36048. It's very, very similar. Wow. Okay, so that's where one of the projections came from. Uh, I believe that was the 32903 was the 100% projection of that prior high to low swing. Underneath that, there was also a 618 retracement from a prior larger swing. And beyond that, there was also a 1272 extension of another low to high swing. So all of those came together as far as price. And then the other thing that was very interesting was that these swings were similar in time also, because you had the first high to low that was 10 weeks down and the second high to low 11. Okay, not exactly equal, but close enough. I always give it plus or minus a, uh, you know, a week or a day, depending on which chart you're looking at. Hmm. So, well, the one more thing, I guess, um, you know, I do expect at least the, you know, the more on the upside and the potential, let's say, if it's a more important low, would be all the way up to that 1272 extension. Hmm. Okay. New all-time highs then for Bitcoin, if that would if if that would play out for sure, right? Yes, yes. Now relate that to the uh, the daily chart. This is our final chart yeah. to go through here. And and this is why you know we have to watch the lower time frame charts, you know, from the setup. So you know the daily would be considered a, a lower time frame chart than the weekly. Now in this one, well, what you can also see is the little pink histogram underneath that January twenty fourth low that was also made at histogram timing. Okay, mm. so when we were trading straight down into it, you wanna look at those cycles for a possible low and reversal. And you know it's more likely if it uh, matches up with the price work. But what you also need to know on this chart is where is the resistance coming in that could kind of blow away the bigger picture scenario. So again, it's just uh, resistance to be aware of. And if you're managing a trade, you would want to trail up stops if you cannot get through that resistance. Carolyn, you dropped a number of little nuggets of investment wisdom along the way. And I love your comment when I asked about how to think about it. You said, well, it's been, you know, it's been, it's been, it's choppy or whatever you said, but so I had to go to the larger time frame. I hope if viewers can at least internalize that, the value of going to the larger time frame to try to make sense of the short-term movements. I think that's there's brilliance in what you uh, what you said there. Carolyn, listen, it is such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for coming on the show and we'll look forward to talking to you again soon. Oh yeah, great. Thanks for having me.
That's Carolyn Barodin, technical analyst, expert in Fibonacci analysis. And I, I love that comment that I, that I mentioned at the end where she was talking about, you know, when you have a period of uncertainty, I think a lot of people sort of get drawn into the short termism, get drawn into what I call the flickering ticks, the short term uh, movements. And I think, uh, you know, Carolyn's comment about focusing on the long term trends and, 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 and just getting the long term picture is really meaningful. I also love how she was lining up, uh, you know, price and time. It reminds me of some of the conversations I've had with you know, Elliott Wave uh, aficionados, especially GAN analysts uh, who have, you know, thought about that relationship between price and time. I tend to think a lot less about the time cycle, a lot more about the price relationships. But I've often found talking with people like Carolyn and others, when you can relate what's happening with price with the natural cycle that a market has tended to uh, demonstrate, it can a lot of times just give you a better sense of what's uh, of, of that natural movement, uh, natural trajectory of some of these uh, some of these charts. Great takes there from uh, from Carolyn Barodin. Let's continue on with our next segment, Banking on Breadth. Earlier today, I actually did a webcast, or sorry, it was yesterday, did a webcast called Breaking Down Breadth uh, at Market Misbehavior. We were talking about uh, some of these breadth indicators and, uh, and how they have evolved recently. And long story short, the breadth picture has changed a great deal um, from November, December, January, now into, uh, into February. I would say the breadth picture now looks very different than it did uh, a couple months ago. And uh, and and it's been it, it's been a it's been a different environment. I would argue a what I'd call a change of character. While the S and P made new highs, and Nasdaq made new highs, uh, you know, going into the uh, into the end of the year. If you look at breadth or momentum uh, on those major averages, the picture is very different. A lot of those were making new highs in November, sort of confirming that there was upside momentum behind the uh, the S and P moving higher. You go into December and January, and you find a lot of those are actually making lower highs. And the the first example that I would show is the cumulative advanced decline line on the New York Stock Exchange. This is looking at all the individual names on the NYSE, and every day how many are closing higher or lower. Well, uh, November through January made a higher closing high on a price basis. Breadth was actually putting in a lower high. Um, the large cap breadth was putting in a higher high. The mid cap breadth was putting in a higher high. But the New York Stock Exchange and the small cap indexes were actually putting in lower highs. And what's interesting there is it is it shows you that some of the riskier stuff, some of the higher beta, beta higher risk, um, more speculative names in the smaller cap space are really not confirming that uh, that uptrend. And, and usually that that will happen not at the beginning of an uptrend, but something uh, at the later stages of a, uh, of a bull market phase where people are starting to take risk off and get into the relative defense of some of those uh, some of those larger names. I also wanted to point out, um, you know, I was asked recently about uh, continuing on breadth here. I was asked about NASDAQ breadth. And here we're looking at the uh, NYSE advanced decline line and the NASDAQ advanced decline line. And I will tell you this, having studied breadth indicators for a number of years and worked with people who follow breadth and made their career out about analyzing breadth data, I'll tell you the NASDAQ breadth data is usually pretty um, uh, unhelpful, I guess is the way I would describe it. It skews negative. And I, I would say the negative trend you tend to see on the NASDAQ breadth is not an indication necessarily of market conditions, but it really tells you a lot more about the construction of the index, right? The NASDAQ has a lot of pretty bad names on there, or pretty um, names that are most likely not ever going to amount to something, and they're listed on the NASDAQ. They're sort of set up to fail. They tend to, and as a result, the breadth lines kind of have that negative skew. You'll have the NASDAQ going higher, but the NASDAQ breadth will be going down. A lot of people, I think, incorrectly assume all right, that's a great bearish divergence. The breadth is going negative. When you're looking at something like the S&P, I think you can make that, that assessment because those are fairly established names, fairly liquid names with certainly the potential to do, uh, to do very good things. The NASDAQ has a lot of things that are probably not um, ready for prime time. And as a result, the, um, uh, the, uh, the breadth data uh, by any measure will tend to have a bit of a negative skew to it. And I've seen that, especially with the uh, cumulative advanced decline line. So I wouldn't put a lot of weight uh, if, you're looking at, uh, if you're looking at that. I would point out just in the last week, when you're talking about a market in a change of character, you're looking for shifts, you're looking for trends starting to emerge, you're looking for indications that things are a little bit different. And I can't help but notice just the steady uh, increase in advancers uh, in the last week, the steady decline in decliners. So it's certainly been, at the least in the last week, even as the market's been kind of chopping around the 4,500 level, you see that there are more and more advancers every day. And, and while again, that is just a short-term read, it certainly indicates that things are uh, are starting to improve at the uh, at the ground level uh, at this point. 
It's interesting also uh, continuing on, Brett, the fact that over 50% of the S&P members are back above their 200-day moving average. That gone down to uh, almost 40% couple of weeks ago in late January, as the S&P was, uh, you know, bouncing off of a 4250, 4300, it's back about 50%. I would say what differentiates a lot of, you know, meaningful, uh, deeper pullbacks with some of the shorter term drawdowns is this indicator remaining about 50%. If you look back on the left side of this chart, that's February, March of 2020, look how we got below 50% and then just remained there for a number of months. And that shows you how much the price action was deteriorating at that time. You compare what we saw there to what we're seeing here. Now, the problem I have is, again, this is sort of the bounce we saw before the big leg down. And, and again, I, I don't know if that would, would happen. I, I don't know if that's necessarily the most probable outcome. I do know it's a possible outcome. And that's why I'm thinking about what this chart would do to turn negative, what that would mean for individual stocks. And an indicator like this remaining about 50% should give you more confidence that we're not getting that sort of disaster scenario. This is more of a backing and filling type of a shorter term drawdown. Percent of stocks above their 50 day, by the way, is back up to 45%, but remaining below 50%, that's another thing I would look for. Usually when that happens, we get below 50%, they get back above. That's usually the all clear telling you that things are starting to improve uh, uh, from the bottom up. The last thing I'll point out is the uh, bullish percent index. We've talked about this chart a number of times before. Um, what's interesting about this chart is if you look back at the last eight times before the, pre the current example, last eight times we've gone below 50%, and gone back above. That's been incredibly, those have been incredibly viable bounces in the S&P going back over the last uh, two years or so. Big outlier is obviously the far left example where we got below uh, the 50% level and remained below there for about a month. And that showed you again, how much the price action was deteriorating. This current market, we actually went right back above the 50% level about a week and a half afterwards, which I would say if I had to decide, I would say it probably relates more closely to some of these viable bounce sort of configurations as opposed to the deeper bombed out ones that you had in 2000, uh, in 2020, probably in 2018 in the fourth quarter when you broke down and remained below 50, uh, 50%. So one breadth uh, input, for example, uh, actually giving a little more of an all clear sign or at the least that, uh, that prices are stabilizing in a, uh, in a decent way. We need to wrap the show, go to the three and three, three charts in three minutes. Here we go. Chart number one is Bitcoin. I liked uh, Carolyn's take on the uh, on, on Bitcoin and recognizing sort of that uh, that upside reversal. I had not thought about the symmetry between these two uh, between these two pullbacks. And now that I'm looking at them, I even indicated the percent changes were very very similar. Uh, but she was talking about the number of weeks and everything, and I think that's that's very very interesting. You sort of have a a pullback playbook for Bitcoin overall, or just a sense of how these two pullbacks are related. You know, I'm very interested to see when this is confirmed rotating back to the upside. Just like the charts that we looked at with Rio Tinto and BHP and others that have had sort of that accumulation, that rotation from distribution to accumulation, arguably you're starting to see that on some of these major coins that we would track. If you take a trend line, taking the highs here going down, we've now broken those trend lines. I don't know how you would, how whichever way you would draw them, we've probably broken it by now. We've, we're starting to get above the recent swing highs from uh, from mid uh, early mid January. So I think that's a chart really starting to show positive improvement with momentum starting to improve as well. And that's what's arguably the most impactive, uh, effective signal. Second chart is American Express. As I was screening earlier today for my premium members about uh, stocks making new three month highs and three month lows and starting to look for opportunities, I was struck by how many charts we had in the financial sector. It was a lot of things. And it's not just particular companies, it's, uh, it's banks, it's consumer finance, uh, it's insurance companies. You have a lot of different charts uh, in a lot of different groups within the financial sector, all really starting to uh, to improve. AXP getting above its October high from last year, I think is significant. If you look at what happened on this chart, we peaked out in July. We retested those levels in September, broke out very briefly in October, then ended up being sort of a failed breakout. And we ended up undercutting the lows from August. Now, all of a sudden, this is more of a base that we're breaking out of to the upside. And I like the fact that it's breaking higher, especially the fact that the relative strength is making a, uh, a new high. Finally, we have the uh, bullish percent index on the S&P 500. This has uh, some uh, prettier uh, imagery on the, uh, on the pullbacks. You can see these shaded areas, which indicate those eight times that I mentioned where we briefly went below 50%, we went right back up, and those ended up being some of the most viable dips over the last, uh, over the last two years. 
I saw this one as a little different because we all of a sudden had gone lower than we had in those previous pullbacks. And it had been a week or so and we hadn't gone back up. Now, all of a sudden we have. And all of a sudden this is looking a lot closer to some of those uh, actionable pullbacks. So again, breadth data is one piece of the picture. I'd be very focused on the S&P itself and see if we get the follow through through some of those key resistance levels that uh, that we were uh, talking about earlier on today's show. That's a wrap for today. Thank you so much for joining us on The Final Bar every weekday after the close. Special thank you to Carolyn Baroden joining us from Las Vegas. For StockCharts.com in Redmond, Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be safe. Have a great night. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.